answer to the question what is enlightening by immanuel kant 1784 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org enlightening is man's quitting the knowledge occasioned by himself knowledge or minority is the inability of making use of one's own understanding without the guidance of another this knowledge is occasioned by oneself when the cause of it is not from want of understanding but of resolution and the courage to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another sapere aude have courage to make use of thy own understanding is therefore the dictum of enlightening laziness and cowardice are the causes why so great a part of mankind after nature has long freed them from the guidance of others naturaliter meorenes willingly remain minors as long as they live and why it is so easy for others to set themselves up as their guardians it is convenient to be a minor if i have a book which has understanding for me a curate who has conscience for me a physician who judges of diet for me etc i need not give myself any trouble i have no occasion to think if i can but pay others will save me the trouble of that irksome business those guardians who have graciously undertaken the superintendence of mankind take sufficient care that by far the greater part of them and all the fair shall hold the step to majority besides the trouble attending it very dangerous after these superintendents have first made them as stupid as their domestic animals and carefully prevented those peaceable creatures from daring to venture a single step beyond the go-cart in which they are enclosed they point out to them the danger that threatens them if they should try to go alone indeed this danger is not so very great for at the expense of a few falls they would learn to walk at last but an example of this sort renders timid and commonly discourages from all further attempts it is therefore difficult for every single man to extricate himself from the knowledge which is almost become natural to him nay it has even become agreeable to him and he is for the present actually incapable of using his own understanding because he never was allowed to make the trial ordinances and formulas the mechanical instruments of a rational use or rather misuse of his gifts of nature are the fetters of an everlasting minority whoever shook them off would take but an uncertain leap over the smallest ditch even because he is not accustomed to such a free motion hence there are few who have succeeded to emancipate themselves from knowledge by their own labor and yet to walk firmly but it is sooner possible for a nation to enlighten itself nay when it has the liberty it is almost infallible for a few who think for themselves will always be found even among the installed guardians of the multitude who after they themselves have thrown off the yoke of knowledge will spread about them the spirit of a rational estimation of the proper value and of the vocation of every man to think for himself it is singular in this that the public which was formerly brought under this yoke by them afterwards compels them themselves to remain under it when this public is thereto stirred up by some of its guardians who are themselves totally incapable of enlightening so pernicious is it to fill with prejudices as they are revenged at last on those themselves who or whose predecessors were their authors hence a nation can attain enlightening but slowly 
a deliverance from personal despotism and interested and tyrannical oppression may perhaps be obtained by a revolution but never a true reform of the caste of mind new prejudices will serve just as well as the old for leading strings to the thoughtless multitude to this enlightening however nothing is required but liberty and indeed the most harmless of all that may be named liberty to wit that to make a public use of one's reason in every point but i hear exclaimed from all sides don't reason the officer says don't reason but exercise the financier don't reason but pay the clergyman don't reason but believe only one master in the world says reason as much as you please and on what you please but obey here is everywhere restriction of liberty but what restriction is a hindrance to enlightening what not but even favorable to it my answer is this the public use of one's reason must always be free and that only can bring about enlightening among men but the private use of it may often be very strictly limited without much hindering the progress of enlightening but the public use of one's own reason however i understand that which every one as a man of letters makes of it in the eyes of the whole reading world i name the private use that which he may make of his reason in a certain civil post or office entrusted to him there is necessary to many businesses which run in with the interest of the commonwealth a certain mechanism by means of which some members of the commonwealth must conduct themselves passively merely in order by an artificial unison directed by the government to public ends to be withholden at least from the destruction of these ends here indeed it is not allowed to reason but one must obey but so far as this part of the machine considers itself at the same time as a member of the whole commonwealth nay even of the cosmopolitical society consequently in the character of a man of letters who addresses himself by writings to the public in the proper sense he may by all means reason without doing any injury thereby to the business to which he is appointed partly as a passive member it would be very hurtful if an officer to whom his superior gives an order should in actual service reason loudly on the conformity to end or expediency of this order he must obey but he as a man of letters cannot in justice be hindered from making his observations on the faults of the military service and from submitting these to the judgment of the public the citizen cannot refuse to pay the taxes imposed on him even a forward censure of such taxes when they are to be paid by him may be punished as a scandal which might occasion universal opposition the very same person notwithstanding that does not act contrary to the duty of a citizen when he as a man of letters publishes his thoughts on the unfitness or even the injustice of such imposts in like manner is a clergyman bound to deliver himself to his congregation in all points according to the symbol of the church which he serves for he was ordained on this condition but as a man of letters he has full liberty nay it is his call to communicate to the public all his carefully proved and well-meant thoughts on what is faulty in that symbol and to make his proposals for the better regulation of the affairs of religion and of the church there is nothing in this which can be burdensome to the conscience for what he teaches pursuant to his office as agent of the church he represents as something in respect of which he has not a free power to teach according to his own sentiments but he is ordered to propound that according to precept and in the name of another 
he may say our church inculcates this or that doctrine these are the arguments it makes use of he then draws all practical profit to his congregation from ordinances to which he himself would not subscribe perhaps with full conviction to whose propounding however he can bind himself because it is not quite impossible that truth might lie therein concealed but at all events nothing is found in them inconsistent at least with the internal religion for did he believe to find in them anything repugnant to this he could not administer his office with a safe conscience he must resign it the use therefore which an established teacher or pastor makes of his reason before his hearers is a private use merely as this is never but a domestic congregation though ever so great and in regard to which he as a priest is not free and dare not be so because he executes the commission of another whereas as a man of letters who speaks by writings to the proper public namely the world consequently the ecclesiastic in the public use of his reason enjoys an unlimited liberty to use his own reason and to speak in his own person for it is an absurdity which tends to the perpetuating of absurdities that the guardians of the people in spiritual things shall themselves be again in a state of knowledge but should not a society of clergymen for instance a church assembly or a reverend class as the dutch clergy name themselves be entitled to bind one another by oath to a certain unalterable symbol in order to exercise an incessant supreme guardianship over every one of their members and by their means over the people and even to eternize this i maintain that that is totally impossible such a contract entered into for the purpose of withholding forever all farther enlightening from the human species is absolutely void and should it be confirmed by the chief power even by diets of the empire and by the most solemn treaties of peace an age cannot league itself and by oath too to put the following age into a state wherein it must be impossible for it to enlarge its knowledge especially a knowledge so very important to purge away errors and in general to make progress in enlightening that were a crime against human nature whose original destination consists directly in this progression and posterity is therefore completely entitled to reject those resolutions as at once incompetently and presumptuously formed the test of all that can be finally determined with regard to the nation lies in the question whether a nation itself could institute such a law this would as it were in the expectation of a better be possible for a determinate short time with a view to introduce a better order if at the same time all the citizens principally the clergy had the liberty in the character of men of letters to make their observations publicly that is by writings on that which is faulty of the present economy but the established order must still continue till the insight into the nature of these things attained such a degree that they the citizens by uniting their voices though not of all could make a proposal to the throne to take under its protection those congregations which had united themselves in an altered economy of religion according to their conceptions of a better introspection without however molesting those who rather choose to continue with the old but to unite oneself in a permanent constitution of religion to be questioned by nobody publicly even but during the lifetime of one man and thereby as it were annihilate a period in the progression of humanity to amendment to render it fruitless and by that means even detrimental to posterity is absolutely not allowed 
a man may indeed as to his own person defer and even then but for a time the enlightening in that which is incumbent on him to know but to renounce it let it be for his own person but still more for posterity is to violate and to trample on the sacred rights of humanity but what a nation cannot finally determine with regard to themselves still less can the monarch determine that finally with regard to the nation for his legislative dignity rests upon his uniting in his own will the common will of the nation if he but takes care that all true or opinionative improvement be consistent with the civil order as for the rest he may let his subjects themselves do what they find it necessary to be done for the sake of the welfare of their own souls that does not concern him but it concerns him to take care that the one shall not violently prevent the other from laboring with all his strength at the determination and furtherance of that welfare he derogates from his own majesty when he interferes with the writings by which his subjects endeavor to perfectionate their insights and thinks them worthy of the inspection of his government as well as when he does this from his own profound introspection where he exposes himself to the exprobration caesar non est supra grammaticos footnote caesar has no power over grammarians End of footnote. as also and still more when he humbles his supreme power so far as to support the ecclesiastical despotism of a few tyrants in his state against his other subjects it is now inquired do we live at present in an enlightened age the answer is no but by all means in an age of enlightening there is still a great deal wanting to men as things are at present on the whole to be in a state or to be but able to be put in a state to make a safe and a good use of their own understanding in affairs of religion without the guidance of another but we have distinct proofs that the field is now opened for them to labor in freely and the hindrances of universal enlightening or of quitting the knowledge occasioned by themselves become by degrees fewer in this respect the present age is the age of enlightening or frederick's century a prince who does not think it unworthy of himself to say that he holds it his duty not to prescribe anything to men in matters of religion but to allow them full liberty therein who declines even the lofty name of being tolerating is himself enlightened and merits to be esteemed as such by the grateful world and by posterity a prince who first freed the human species from knowledge at least on the part of government and gave them liberty in all that is an affair of conscience to use their own reason under him could respectable clergymen in the character of men of letters without prejudice to the duty of their office freely expose to the world to be proved their judgments and insights here and there deviating from the received symbol and still more every other person who is limited by no duty of office this spirit of liberty diffuses itself outwardly also even where it has to struggle with external impediments of a government misunderstanding itself for it gives an example to that government that it needs not on account of liberty be under the smallest solicitude for the tranquillity and union of the commonwealth men naturally extricate themselves insensibly from the state of rudeness and barbarity when invention is not purposely plied to keep them in it the stress of the principal point of enlightening that of men's quitting the knowledge occasioned by themselves i have laid upon matters of religion chiefly 
because with regard to arts and sciences our rulers have no interest in playing guardian over their subjects besides that state of knowledge is not only the most pernicious but the most dishonorable of any but the way of thinking of a head of the state who favors enlightening penetrates farther and prospects that even in regard to his legislation there is no danger in allowing his subjects to make a public use of their reason and to lay before the world their thoughts on a better constitution and even a free and honest criticism of the present we have an eminent example of this in which no monarch ever surpassed him whom we honor but only he who enlightened himself is not only not afraid of his shadow but has at hand a well-disciplined numerous army as a security for the public tranquillity can say what a free state dares not risk reason as much as you please and on what you please but obey thus a strange unexpected course of human affairs prevents itself here so that when it is contemplated in the gross almost everything is paradoxical in it a greater degree of civil liberty seems advantageous to the liberty of the spirit of the nation and yet places insuperable barriers to it whereas a degree less of that gives this full scope to extend itself to the utmost of its faculty when nature has then unfolded under this rough rind the germ of which she takes the most tender care namely the propensity and the call to thinking freely this gradually reacts on the minds of the people whereby they become by degrees more capable of the liberty of acting and finally even on the principles of the government which finds it profitable for itself to treat man who is now more than a mere machine conformably to his dignity footnote in Bushling's weekly intelligencer of the thirteenth september i read today the thirtieth instant the notice of the berlin monthly publication of this month september seventeen eighty four wherein mr moses mendelssohn's answer to this very question is mentioned it has not yet reached me else it would have prevented the present which may now remain for the purpose of experimenting how far chance can effectuate a consonancy of sentiments End of footnote. End of answer to the question, What is enlightening? by Immanuel Kant, 1784.